guys welcome back to the channel so not sure if you guys can tell but I did get a new microphone so hopefully the audio quality on these things will be a little better but today I'm covering the case of the murders of Andrew and Abby Borden but more specifically whether their daughter Lizzie was responsible we will discuss important details their backgrounds and events surrounding the case so sit back relax and let's dive in. Lizzie Andrew Borden was born July 19, 1860 in Fall River, Massachusetts to Sarah Anthony and Andrew Jackson Borden. Her father grew up in very modest surroundings and struggled financially as a young man. He eventually prospered in the manufacture and sale of furniture and caskets, going on to becoming a successful property developer. He directed several textile mills, including the Globe Yarn Mill Company, Troy Cotton, and Woolen Manufacturing Company. He owned a considerable amount of commercial property and was both the president of the Union Savings Bank and Trust Company. It's pretty clear he was well off. His estate valued at $300,000, equivalent to $8,540,000 today. Despite his wealth, he was a very frugal man. For instance, the Borden home lacked plumbing and electricity, which at the time was a common accommodation for wealthy people. Lizzie and her older sister Emma were both brought up relatively religious. As a young woman, Lizzie was very involved in church activities and Christian organizations. In 1863, Lizzie's mother passed away from uterine congestion and spinal disease. Three years after her passing, Andrew married Abby Durfee Gray. Lizzie and her stepmother didn't have a cordial relationship. She began referring to her as Mrs. Borden as she refused to acknowledge her as her stepmother. Lizzie believed Abby had only married her father for his wealth. Tensions were growing within the Borden home over minor arguments and disputes, but mostly from Andrew's generous gifts of real estate to various members in Abby's family. Andrew was not a popular man within the community in River Falls. It often being reported he had many enemies. Several days before the murders, the family grew ill from what Abby suspected was a case of poisoning from one of those enemies. On August 3, 1892, John Vinicum Morse, Lizzie's uncle on her mother's side, arrived at the Borden home. He came to visit to discuss business matters with Andrew. Some theorized the business matters pertained to a property transfer which may have aggravated the already tense situation in the Borden home. He was invited to sleep in the guest room and stay for a few days. The next morning, Andrew, Abby, Lizzie, John, and the maid Bridget Sullivan, whom the family called Maggie, had breakfast together. Emma was out of town. Afterwards, Andrew and John went to the sitting room and spoke for nearly an hour. John left the home around 8.48 a.m. to go run errands and was planning to return for lunch at noon. Andrew left for his morning walk sometime after 9 a.m. Although Lizzie and Emma were supposed to clean the guest room as a chore, Abby chose to do the task. She went upstairs between 9 and 10.30 a.m. to make the bed. This was the last time anyone saw her alive. According to the forensic investigation, Abby was facing her attacker at the time. She was struck on the side of her head with a hatchet, which cut her just above the ear. This caused her to turn and fall face down on the floor, creating contusions on her nose and forehead. Her killer then struck her multiple times, delivering 17 more direct blows to the back of her head. Andrew returned around 10.30 a.m., but was unable to get the door open. He knocked to alert someone. Maggie unlocked the door, but found it was jammed. Andrew asked Lizzie where Abby was, and then she stated she had received a notice from a messenger that her friend was sick and she went to visit her. This was significant because Abby was already dead at this point. Lizzie stated she helped her father remove his boots and helped him into slippers before he laid down on the sofa for a nap. This anomaly was contradicted by the crime scene photos, though, which show Andrew wearing boots. Afterwards, Lizzie told Maggie about a department store sale and permitted her to go. Maggie declined, though. She was still feeling unwell from the sickness everyone had contracted and chose to go to her room instead. Maggie states she was in her room upstairs resting when just before 11.10 a.m., Lizzie began calling for her. Maggie, come quick. Father's dead. Someone came in and killed him. Andrew was slumped on a couch downstairs in the sitting room. He was struck 10 to 11 times with a hatchet-like weapon. 
One of his eyeballs had been split cleanly in two, suggesting he was asleep when attacked. The wounds were still bleeding when he was found, pointing to a very recent attack. Lizzie sent Maggie to get Dr. Bowen, the family physician who confirmed the deaths. It was concluded Andrew died around 11 a.m. The police also arrived to begin the investigation. Lizzie's initial answers to the police questioning were at the time strange and contradicting. Lizzie was the only one in the house at the time of Abby's murder. Everyone else was away from the house except Maggie, who was outside washing windows. She explained to the police she had heard no noises out of the ordinary, but then two hours later said she had heard a groan from upstairs when she was downstairs. Lizzie explained she thought her mother had left due to the messenger, but when the home was searched, no note was ever discovered. Maggie told officers that she returned inside at 10.30 a.m. in time to help Andrew inside, but upon her arrival, she heard a muffled laugh coming from upstairs that she assumed was Lizzie. When questioned about her whereabouts for Andrew's murder, Lizzie explained she was in the barn loft for 15 to 20 minutes looking for lead sinkers to go fishing. But when police went to check the barn, they found it so stifling hot they could not imagine someone staying there for 20 minutes, and they found no footprints in the loft to corroborate her alibi. Police did not like Borden and her attitude, many believing she was too calm and poised for such a situation. The police admitted to not conducting a proper search of the home due to Lizzie not feeling well. Lizzie nor Maggie were searched for blood on their clothing. Her room was searched, but it was a cursory inspection. They found two hatchets, two axes, and a hatchet head with a broken handle in the basement. Police suspected the hatchet head was the murder weapon due to the break in the handle appearing to be fresh and the dust on the head. Unlike the other bladed tools, this one appeared to have been deliberately applied to make it look as if it had been in the basement for some time. Police failed to remove any of the tools from the home. Residents also reported the day before the murder, Lizzie was seen visiting Smith's Drug Store, where she attempted to purchase pusic acid that she said she needed to clean a sealskin cape, despite the poison not having antiseptic properties. The autopsy for Andrew and Abby were performed in the dining room of the home. Their stomachs were removed to test for poison. None were found. The neighbor, Alice Russell, stayed with Lizzie the days following the murder. On August 6th, police performed a more thorough search of the house, inspecting their clothing and confiscating any possible evidence like the hatchet. The mayor visited the same day and informed Lizzie she was being investigated as a suspect. The next day, Russell found Lizzie in the kitchen burning a blue corduroy dress in the stove. Lizzie explained she had ruined the dress with paint and that's why she was getting rid of it. It was never determined if this dress was the dress she was wearing the day of the murders. Borden appeared at the inquest hearing on August 8th. Some believe due to her prescription for morphine to calm her nerves, her testimony may have been affected. Her behavior was erratic, and she often refused to answer a question, even if the answer would be beneficial to her. She continued to contradict herself and produce alternating accounts of the morning in question. On August 11th, Lizzie was served with a warrant and jailed. Her trial took place on June 5, 1893. The prominent point of the discussion was the hatchet head found in the basement. Prosecutors argued the killer removed the handle because it would have been covered in blood. Though bloody clothes were not found, Russell did testify against Lizzie about the dress she'd burned. Lizzie's presence in the house was also a point of dispute during the trial. According to the testimony, Maggie had entered the upstairs of the home at 10.58 a.m. and left Lizzie downstairs with her father. Lizzie had told several people that at this time she went into the barn and was not in the house for 20 minutes. Hyman Lubensky an ice cream delivery man, testified for the defense that he saw Lizzie leaving the barn at 11.03 a.m. while on his route. This was corroborated with another witness. Both of the victim's heads were removed during the autopsy and admitted into evidence. Upon seeing them in the courtroom, Borden fainted. Lizzie trying to buy the poison from the druggist was excluded due to the judge ruling the incident had no connection to the crime. On June 20, 1893, after one and a half hours of deliberation, the jury acquitted Lizzie Borden of the murders. 
Lizzie still to this day remains the main suspect in the case despite her acquittal. But if not Lizzie, then who? Lizzie was the only member in the home who had the opportunity to commit the murders. For an outside intruder to commit both murders, they would have either had to hide in the house for 90 minutes or depart, then return without being seen. Plus, police stated it looked like an inside job. There were no signs of forced entry anywhere in the home, and nothing was stolen. Lizzie and her sister both stood to gain an estate well worth $8 million and the ability to be free of their father who controlled many aspects of their life. But, besides the money, many suggestions have been presented as to why Lizzie would have done it. Writer Victoria Lincoln proposed that Borden may have committed the murders in a fugue state. Another suggestion was Lizzie could have been physically and sexually abused by her father. There is little evidence to support these claims, though. Incest was not a topic that would have been discussed at the time, and the methods for collecting physical evidence were much different in 1892. Mystery author Ed McBain suggests Borden committed the murders after being caught in a lesbian tryst with the maid, Maggie. He speculates Abby had caught the women together and reacted with horror and disgust, and in response, Lizzie killed her. When Andrew returned, Lizzie confessed to him, but killed him as well because of an identical reaction. In her later years, Borden was rumored to be a lesbian, but there was no speculation about Maggie, who would later marry a man. Maggie died in 1948, but on her deathbed confessed to her sister she changed her testimony on the stand to protect Lizzie. After the trial, the Borden sisters moved to a large modern house in Fall River, fully staffed with servants. Lizzie began to use the name Lisbeth A. Borden. Despite her acquittal, Borden was ostracized by the community. Emma would move from the house some years later due to disputes. Lizzie would never see her again. Borden fell ill in her last year of life following the removal of her gallbladder. She died of pneumonia on June 1, 1927 in Fall River, Massachusetts. Funeral details were not published and very few people attended. Emma died nine days later from chronic nephritis at the age of 76 in a nursing home in Newmark, New Hampshire. She moved there in 1923 to avoid publicity around the murders. The sisters never married and were buried side by side in the family plot in Oak Grave Cemetery. At the time of her death, Borden was worth $250,000 equivalent to $4,938,000 now. Upon her death, she left $30,000 to the Fall River Animal Rescue League, $500 in a trust for perpetual care of her father's grave, and distributed the rest among friends and family. Lizzie Borden's story has been retold through many books and films. Today, the Borden home operates as a haunted bed and breakfast in River Falls, Massachusetts. The house still stands in the same conditions as it did when the family lived there. You can even stay in the room where Abby was murdered. But the truth remains unsolved. Who killed Lizzie Borden's parents? Hey guys, thanks for tuning in this week. So uh, Lizzie Borden is one of those historic cases and I feel like on the topics of unsolved and true crime, it's almost criminal to not talk about it but I do want to know your thoughts so do you think Lizzie did it do you think she was alone do you think she had an accomplice or do you think it was just some random person who broke in and committed the heinous acts or maybe it was those one of those enemies that they they said Andrew had but um I want you guys to you know share your thoughts with me as always, I couldn't keep this up without your support, so thank you, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!